Today on Pet Heroes. When a chronic medical condition spirals out of control, one woman's only hope is her dog. And a cat's unusual behavior alerts a man to a life-threatening illness. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. With their master's lives in danger, pets are often quick to intervene. But what happens when that threat is coming from within? We examine two stories of people who are facing life-threatening medical emergencies and the animals who saved them. Linda Thompson has always been an avid dog lover. I do have a habit of bringing lost animals home. Um, done it my whole life. I grew up with um, really good parents. They were very understanding. Um, we always had dogs. It was mostly dogs. And they've all been unique in their own way, and they've all been great dogs. I think Mark Twain said it best when he said, if you pick up a starving dog and feed him, he won't bite you. And that's the principal difference between dog and man. These are my dogs, um, a number of the dogs that I've had over the years. That's Kaylee. This is Ursa, the last dog we had in the house prior to just having Emma. And then that's Kaylee again. That's a friend's dog, Christy. That's Tisa. That's Ben. And that's Kaya. She was found tied to the shelter door one night. She'd been abandoned. We got Emma in October of 1997. Uh, she was seven months old. She is the most tenacious dog I've ever seen. She, she will not back down, even now. And so she became Hurricane Emma. We don't treat her like she's a dog at all. And she doesn't know she's a dog. She thinks she's a little person in a fur coat. She was found outside of Hope, BC. Uh, someone found her in the bush with bailing wire tied around her muzzle. We estimate that she was alone for three or four weeks. She had managed to get her mouth open enough that she could get water, but she couldn't eat. So she was very malnourished and actually suffered from rickets. When I got her, her, her muzzle was still kind of like raw hamburger. It hadn't healed. She has a granulated scar across her muzzle that you can see to this day. It just, the hair never grew back because it was so deep. Because of the rickets, she developed um, very bowed rear legs and eventually had to have both cruciate ligaments repaired in both knees. And I can't come up with any reason for why you do that to a six-month-old puppy. A dedicated animal rescuer, Linda has facilitated the rescue of over 50 dogs. Emma's stay was not intended to be permanent. I told my husband that we'd find her a home and that I would start working on it. But within a few days, it became clear she wasn't going anywhere. And he fell in love with her very quickly. In 1995, Linda was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, an autoimmune disease called systemic sarcoidosis. It's supposed to attack your lungs. In my case, it was very serious. It attacked my liver, my spine, and it also attacked my pancreas, leaving me with type 1 diabetes, so I'm insulin dependent. Type 1 diabetes is a disease that presents in the young, typically under the age of 35, uh, and it requires insulin therapy. Without insulin, every person with type 1 diabetes will die within 12 months. Linda has had a very special device to help her with her diabetes. It's called a, an insulin pump sensor uh, combination. Um, the insulin pump infuses insulin into her body at a rate that she determines. I wear it here. It's uh, attached to my body by a, a, an in, what's called an infusion set. And there's a cannula that sits under the skin here that delivers insulin. This is the reservoir that holds the insulin, and it's delivered through this tube. Besides the insulin pump, Linda has a glucometer to test her insulin levels and glucose pills to bring her blood sugar up. She incorporates all of these as well as the medicine she takes for her autoimmune disorder into her daily life. The first five years that I, I had the disease, I was okay. You know, I get sick now and then, but it wasn't a big deal. But in 2000, things started to, to go downhill. I nearly died twice. I crashed five times. Then, in 2006, things go from bad to worse. 
I suffered a multi-system organ failure oh and was in a coma for three and a half weeks and in ICU for five and a half weeks. And that really was the turning point where I was critically ill after that. We were told I was terminally ill and I had five to seven years to live and I was gonna need a new liver and, and that's exactly what happened. Emma never left my side when I was sick. From March of 2006, when I was critically ill, until, well, until now. I mean, she's, she is my shadow. I was on death's door for probably the better part of two years, uh, two and a half years. The pattern of Linda's illness becomes tragically regular. Every few weeks, she falls into a coma, recuperates in hospital, and is sent home until she's too sick to carry on. And you could pretty well set your clock by me. I'd be out cold for three days, and then I'd wake up. And I'd be about 80% normal right away. And then it would take a couple of days to get me the back the rest of the way. And then once I was stable and my diabetes was stabilized, then they'd send me home. And I'd be all right for a couple of weeks. And then the third week, I'd start to get more confused as the toxins built up. And then I'd end up back in the same situation again. But it was much harder on my family than it was on me. Emma is always nearby, keeping a close watch and even alerting Linda's husband when the situation becomes critical. Linda, come on. There were many times when Emma was the only presence in the house that my husband had to come home to. She was his, his support. They supported each other. A blustery night in October 2009 is one like any other in Linda's touch-and-go existence. It was raining horribly all day and all evening and all night. And um, otherwise, it was an uneventful day. I went to bed at 10 o'clock, the way I usually do on a work night. But Linda is in extreme danger and doesn't even know it. The alarm on Linda Thompson's insulin monitor rings out. Her blood sugar levels have reached a dangerous low. But Linda, still half asleep, switches it off without realizing what she's done. She was whining quite loudly. She was in my face and making a lot of noise. It's quite unusual for Emma to wake me up at 3 a.m. and I assumed that she wanted to go outside. So I said, you want to go outside? She turned around and headed for the door and headed to the hall. So I got up and trotted after her. Sort of stumbled after her down the hall. I didn't understand that I wasn't quite right when I was following her down the hall to the kitchen. as far as the counter in the kitchen, and the dog wouldn't go past the counter. I uh, thought perhaps rather than going out, she wanted uh, food or water, but her bowls were both full. So I knew it wasn't that. And so I kind of urged her on and said, go on, go on, go on, and she wouldn't go. And um, then I finally realized that, A, my vision was very blotchy, and black, big black spots in front of my eyes, and that I was really quite, quite out of it into my kind of befuddledness, I noticed that she was looking at the glucometer, the meter that I used to check my blood sugar level. Wendy McClellan, a doctor of veterinary medicine, offers her unique perspective on animal behavior. When pets like Emma spend so much time with someone, they're able to detect minute changes in behavior and scent. And Emma has learned that these small changes can have dire effects for Linda. And that is why Emma sticks so close by Linda's side. I tested my blood sugar, and it was critically low, very, very low. If it had been any lower, I likely would have blacked out. 
or not awakened at all. The typical procedure when you have a, a low blood sugar like I had is to take glucose tablets. They very quickly dissolve in your mouth. So I took four of those. In this case, Emma is probably picking up on one of two things. Hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, can have a certain scent which Emma could pick up on Linda's breath. The other thing that Emma is likely picking up on is small changes in Linda's behavior, whether it's a bit of shakiness, unsteadiness that Linda may not yet recognize herself. With her blood sugar up, the problem is solved. Or so Linda thinks. At which point, uh, after I tested my blood sugar, the dog immediately went outside. And in the pouring rain at 3 a.m., laid down in the grass and wouldn't come back. Normally, she would run out, do her business, and then run back in as fast as her little legs could carry her. She laid out there for 15 or 20 minutes. Frankly, I was a little annoyed <laughs> because it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and I just wanted to go back to bed. And it was, it was raining very hard, so... I mean, I, I knew something was up because it's very out of character for her to do that. So I knew something was wrong. Eventually, I was in the process of getting my shoes when she came back in. And then I wiped her off with a towel. But when Linda tries to return to bed, Emma again stops at the kitchen counter and stares at her glucometer. She wouldn't let me go back to bed. I had been known to go out and get a couple of glucose tablets and eat them, and then go straight back to bed without testing to make sure I was OK. You typically would wait 15 minutes and then retest your blood. So she wouldn't let me go back to bed until she made sure that I had actually dealt with it. And so I tested my blood sugar a second time, and I said to her, it's OK, it's fine. And then she just trotted off down the hall and went back to bed. So by watching Linda closely, Emma was able to understand the process that led to the scent going away. And that's what helped save Linda from a potentially fatal coma. Emma would not let Linda return to bed until that scent was gone. Dr. Michael McCullough is the director of research at the Pine Street Institute in California, where he's looking into the link between animals and early disease detection. The theory is based on the uh, idea that an, one animal knows the health status of another animal by smell. When dogs are uh, trained to help individuals with diabetes, they're testing for the compound uh, called ketones that come out in the urine or in the perspiration. We think that the dog just has a keen sense for what's a person's normal operating range, and that anything that goes outside of that range, those animals are going to be uh, disturbed by that and alerted to it. We were ecstatically surprised by the high degree of accuracy of the animals. So if it hadn't been for Emma, I'm really not too sure what would have happened that night. It could have ended very badly. I don't believe she alerted to the alarm. I believe that the dog alerts to uh, some sort of scent. The, the little bit of research that I've done on hypoalert dogs, which is actually what she is, uh, indicates that it is some sort of scent oriented. Linda also asserts that Emma, having observed her testing and medication rituals for so long, knew everything about them, including what to do when trouble struck. The dog has me trained so that if um, she comes in and she whines, the first thing I do is I check my blood with my glucometer. In 2009, Linda received a new liver, and with it, a new lease on life. She now works as a diabetes case manager, helping others cope with the disease. My liver is very happy. I have no sign of rejection. I, I just have a brand new life. I've never been so happy or so fulfilled, and I love my work, and, and it's great. We were very lucky that we got her. Um, but I guess you could say that we saved her, sure. And I definitely think she saved me, no question in my mind. She's amazing. She's just amazing. Sadly, not long after we completed filming, Emma passed away. Linda will always remember Emma, not just for saving her life, but for being a loyal and beloved member of the family. We just saw how one dog's keen sense was able to prevent a woman from slipping into a diabetic coma. Next, we examine the story of Lionel Adams, 
and his cat, Tiger. Lionel Adams and Carrie Parker have been together for the last 15 years. They live with their two cats, Oliver and Tiger. Uh, we got Oliver, who's a Siamese tabby cross, and we got Tiger, who's a tabby, orange tabby. They're big babies. Tiger's a daddy's boy, Oliver's a mama's boy. But yeah, they're very protective. A lot of nights when I come in the house, he'll meet me at the door, and then I'll sit down on the couch, and the first thing you know, he's in my lap. Come on, Dad, give me some loving. You know? Like, like right now. You know? I picked him up, and he's happy. He just wants to be petted, wants to be loved. While walking home one day, Carrie discovers Tiger, a stray cat living on the streets. Carrie reluctantly decides to take the stray cat home. Oh, he fit in great. He, like, he always went to Lionel first, which I thought was kind of neat because a lot of cats won't go towards the guys, but he went right to Lionel. He loved Lionel from the day one. In the fall of 2008, Tiger begins pawing continuously at the left side of Lionel's chest. I would lay down while I was having a nap or, or whatnot, and he would just lay beside me and kind of go with his paws like that on my side, like as if to say, there's something in there, Dad. Get it out of there. It shouldn't be in there. Cat's sense of smell isn't nearly as strong as dogs, but it's still very good. In Lionel's case, Tiger was able to detect something that shouldn't be there in Lionel's breath. This led, we speculate, to Tiger to paw at the chest to draw attention to something that shouldn't be there. So this went on for a couple of months. My breathing was getting worse and worse. I've had lung problems for years. When I was a kid, Growing up in northern Ontario, I had pneumonia uh, for a, every year for the first 14 years of my life. So I have scar tissue all over my lungs. With Lionel's history of respiratory illness, the doctors don't believe his condition to be serious. Lionel. And they thought, oh, it's probably nothing, and I insisted they do something, so they did. Well, they started off with the x-rays, normal x-rays, and CAT scan. They did a couple CAT scans, and that's when they noticed something on the left side. After a long series of testing, doctors have discovered stage one lung cancer. Yeah, the doctors were very surprised, because where, where the cancer was was right where the tiger was pine. So in January of 2009, they had openings at the Foothills Hospital and decided to uh, take it out. Pine Street Foundation was founded in 1989, and early detection uh, tests for cancer was one of our early motivations uh, in this organization. The way that we think that animals are spontaneously detecting uh, cancer in their and human companions is that they probably know the human very well and therefore have established a baseline when everything's good, when the person is in good spirits and good health, they smell like this. If they get uh, upset or disturbed or become ill, they're going to smell different. Uh, that's the net result of all the different physiological processes in the body that are involved in illness and the body's response to that illness. There's going to be something biologically different about that human that the animal is going to notice and, in many cases, be disturbed by. Lionel's cancer is successfully removed, and he's able to return home to Carrie and Tiger. Cats generally aren't as social as dogs, so Lionel was very fortunate that him and Tiger had formed such a close relationship. This close relationship is what allowed Tiger to detect Lionel's cancer. The animals have shown us proof of principle. Proof of principle uh, that illness can be detect detected by odor. If illness can be detected by odor and an animal can tell us that, that means that through analytic chemistry, we can identify, well, what are those compounds that are coming from the breath? 
and those compounds can then be detected in a, a breathalyzer for cancer. I think Tiger did what he did because he loved this human and he knew there was something there that shouldn't be there and he was trying to let me know that there was something there. As it is, they caught it uh, in lower stage one and managed to get it out. If it had gone on for another seven or eight months, like the specialist at the hospital told me, it could have gotten worse. And I've been cancer free now for a year and a half and I'm not having any symptoms and I still think it's because of the cat, because of Tiger. With a sense of smell vastly superior to humans and the ability to pick up on minute changes in their master's behavior, both dogs and cats can detect abnormalities occurring inside the human body. Linda Thompson and Lionel Adams have their pets to thank for saving their lives.